That is definitely a consideration. If you came from outside of our airspace and two fixes in, in your route or airports in our airspace, way to go. Flight plan of the day award. I'd hand it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ready. This is Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Your host, Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf, have a combined 40 years of aviation experience as pilots and air traffic controllers. They answer your questions and share their opinions about flying and air traffic control. This show is not official guidance and should not be used as a replacement for your instructor, your pilot examiner, the endless books of regulations, your favorite comedian, your neighbor, your spouse, or your cat. November 6 to 8, Charlie Delta Squawk 1200, frequency change approved. The audio will be available on live ATC. Good day. November 643, Juliet Mike, third visual truck from way 23 left, Conic Tower. November 3222, Yankee, area of heavy to extreme precipitation, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, 15 miles, 7 and miles. Uh, 3047, Charlie, try a departure, let our contact climb and maintain. November 747, Sierra Lima, reduce speed to 180, you're overtaking traffic ahead on final. Skyhawk 77 Tango, IFR cancellation received. Squawk 3 far, frequency change approved. Sierra 720 Fox, Tron Alpha, flatting 190 vectors for the visual approach. Skyhawk Runway 23 left. Charlie to enter Triad Class Charlie surface area from the east. Maintain special Charlie VFR Fox, conditions. Golf Fox, Tron Alpha, this is Triad Approach on guard. You are being intercepted. The border is still closed. Say intentions. Please welcome your favorite controllers, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel. It's Monday, October 17, 2022, episode 250. On today's show, we'll talk about just the right amount of information to share with ATC on your VFR flight, a busy class Bravo controller's take on the speed limit, and more of your awesome questions and feedback. What's up, BG? Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Happy 250th episode. 250. 250. What's our price? <laughs> Are there prizes? Do we get a prize? I don't know. Do we? We should. <laughs> we really should. Like something, a little plastic trophy. I like that. Mm. I never got a trophy as a kid. Mm. Does your team always lose? Yes. <laughs> oh. Yep. <laughs> and that was that was back when you didn't get a trophy for losing. Correct. You didn't get the, oh, you showed up at the banquet that cost your parents an extra 150 bucks? Oh, yeah. <laughs> here's your trophy. <laughs> right. No, there wasn't that. Mm. <clears throat> we did not make a big deal out of 250, but it is a big deal. So there we go. That was it. Yeah. Yay. Do, 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 do. <laughs> I, tr I taught myself a new trick this week. I'm still working on it. I see you I... shaking your head. I don't want to hear it. No. This it's going to change your life. You have to try it. What 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 you're telling me is you're working the trackball with one hand. Yep. And the the keyboard with your left hand? Yep, I can type like with a real keyboard, but I'm teaching my left hand to do all the typing and I and I keep it there. Okay? I keep it on the keyboard. To resist the urge to type with my right hand, which all right, let's give a little background. We used to have to the the trackball was to the left of the keyboard in the old Tricon. Yes. And it was stuck in the desk. You couldn't move it. You were forced to, if, if you, whatever you used to type, you, you picked up your typing hand and then moved it to the, to the trackball to affect the change you were looking to do. A handoff, yep. a scratch pad entry. You, I didn't see anybody type with two hands or use a track. You would, it would be like weird T-Rex arms, like, Stuck together. Okay. Well, you follow me so far? Yeah, I'm with you. So now I take the keyboard, I put it on the left where it should be. The trackball is on the right. Like if I was playing a video game, I would use my right hand for the trackball. Yes. And you could do instantaneous changes to scratch pads. Ch -ch -ch type, boom, right there with the other hand. No lifting, no moving. It's it's changing the way I work. It's amazing. <laughs> I I don't know what to say. 
try it. It's going to change you. It's going to change the way you work. I can't do it. If you keep it in the middle, it's above the counter level, and it takes away some of your writing surface. So now I've created this awesome free space where all my strips can go in the middle of these two devices. So you've moved the keyboard way to the left. Way to the left. And the trackball way to the right. Yep. I'm like, I'm at a 30 or 40 degree angle off my body to these two devices. Oh, my word. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right. I mean, I could try it, but I'd rather not. I really would rather not. (laughs) Any new fun things in the the, uh, (laughs) new, new tower for you this week? Um, let's see. Anything new? I don't, I don't think so. I did work. I worked my first like actual busy session on local with a jet, a P8 in the pattern with two and two small guys in the pattern Mm -hmm. at the same time and a tour of five pilots. Hmm. Who were sort of freaked out that I had three planes in the pattern and was <laughs> talking to them at all. <laughs> Where were they from? Uh, they were corporate um, hmm. corporate jet guys. Oh, the random Parkers that got invited up by the person who wasn't there to do the tour? Exactly. <laughs> right. Who Who is on a a tirade of inviting everyone. <laughs> It's just everyone he talks to. On it's like it's the end of every transmission. Hey, yeah, come will. on up. We're in the new tower. Come on up. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we don't like to give tours. Okay, don't get the wrong impression. But no. sometimes we we really don't have the people to do it. Yeah, you yeah. have to stay with them and walk them around. They can't be left to wander. <laughs> yeah, just here. Come in the building and show yourself around. Yes, and of course they follow all the administrative rules to to get that tour to effect, to to legally happen. Huh? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, right. Yeah, this is of course. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I don't really have any good stories outside of the new keyboard thing. We changed some things. We moved some. We we put up a new map in the Tracon this week that went up today. I think you saw that picture yesterday. Uh, yes, I did. Okay, so that's that's live now. It's up. It's okay. up. It still has room to improve, but this is a much better starting point than the red screen of words that was just a collection of all of our notebooks and our cheat sheets downstairs. Right. It's more organized now. Did we talk on the last show about uh, radio response times? Did I go on that little tirade last mm- week? You you had the opportunity because one of those amazing center controllers was talking about a drone taking five to seven seconds to respond because of the relay, and then you went off on sort of a tangent on that. Okay. Well, I think it was between the last show and now. I just about lost my mind. So <laughs> I'm going to reiterate again. I get I get that you're training. I get it's student pilot. Uh, and you want the student to be on the radios, Mm -hmm. there can't be five seconds of of dead air when it's Mm. busy. No. It it just can't. And then, so, you know, at a certain point, I'm going to make the decision to move on to the next transmission. This is not now your turn to read anything back. I've moved, I've skipped you. You've essentially been pushed to the end of the line. You are in the penalty box. (laughs) (laughs) And when you wait for me to make another transmission and then read yours back at the same time that that person is reading theirs back, Mm. it just doubles my frustration. Mm -hmm. And that was happening all the time. One of those days, I just Mm. almost, I almost quit. I just about walked out, said, I'm done. Here's my badge. I won't do this anymore. Here's my ratings. Cut up. I just cut my FAA ratings in half and threw them on the manager's desk. Said I can't do this anymore. Hey, you got to work when I flew. You were working my airplane. I flew. I did. I did. I I, I flew around. I sampled the area with three different sets of controllers from different facilities. 
course we've given we give the best instructions the best controllers here at the triad we do yep we are yes. and you kept an eye on me you worked me you were in the ta- you were in radar on my I, I was and i gave i think my first ever simultaneous radar contact and clearance for an approach in the same transmission mm, a one hitter yes so it was radar contact six northwest of the fix cross the fix at cleared for the approach which i think i anticipated because it was all set up and i was already aimed towards <laughs> that fix i was vfr i was by myself doing vfr stuff practice approaches it was clear in a million I didn't put any foggles on before anybody asks. No, I did not limit my ability to see outside. (laughs) But I got some good airplane time and worked with the GPS. And I think I did five or six different approaches in different airspace. It was fun. So thank you for looking out for me. Thank you for calling up because I got in there and (laughs) KD was in Mm -hmm. and I was getting her out. And I said, who is that V tag up there? <laughs> <laughs> and I hit the Beaconator and I saw that it was you. And I said, he's he's not talking to anybody. Hold what on. What is he doing? And then like 10 seconds later. So anyway. Hold on. I got immediately got flight flown out of the airport I took the plane off from. Uh-huh. I flew northbound. got handed off to center. They cleared me for an ILS at an airport that we sometimes block for. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, when I, and I, he said, what do you want to do after this? And I said, I want to go westbound. I'm going to be right on the border of you and Triad. I, I don't want to talk to them until I'm done with that approach because I know exactly where I am in the scheme of things. I'm just going to be in the way right there in terms of I'm, I'm running the boundary. I'm VFR super low. It's no man's land right there. So I went, did that approach. I came back and it, I was holding at the final approach fix. It's just a reverse course to go back to the hold. And I held there on my own for a little bit. I know where I was. I was right on the boundary. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I was listening. <laughs> uh, the the tr- CPC you got out was super busy. Yes. So I said, I'll wait. And then <laughs> yeah, I got one touch from, from her as well. I called her up north of a fix. Hey, I'm here. I want to go here. She said, do you want a clearance? Which she couldn't do because I was on a fence. I said, nope. I just want you to watch me. I'll say goodbye in a minute. Okay. And that's all that happened. Uh, okay. That's how you. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I was only by myself, no ATC for an approach on the boundary and, and a couple laps and a hold. That's it. Okay. Maybe okay. 20 minutes mm. out of a four-hour flight. Okay, all right. That's fair. All right. <laughs> four hours. It's, I'll accept it. Okay. Shall we begin? Yes. All right. Ready. So it's OB249. We have a couple new patrons in the show listeners here, Mike Kilo and Echo Romeo. Some of our patrons are in the live stream chat room by YouTube right now playing a game we call Oh Bingo. See that? See what we did there? Uh-huh. <laughs> you don't know what we're talking about? Check out patreon.com slash opposing bases and get access to early recordings, live stream video, store discounts, and become part of an awesome aviation community while supporting the show. If you haven't done so already, hit subscribe or follow so our episodes are waiting for you each week. And take the time, please. Leave us a five-star rating and a review. We may read it on the show. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Boop, 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 boop. Hooray, hooray. Oh, ah. Announcement and a review. Announcement and review. Which one do you want? Which is first? Uh, oh. They're kind I'll of stuck do. together. Uh, number one, patron Bravo Bravo passed their private pilot check ride. Mm, congrats. Excellent. Excellent. Well done. Mm-hmm. That's a big deal. Congrats. All right. The review from Why Would You Download It? <laughs> <laughs> They're on to us. They know how to change these names now. Uh <laughs> Five stars, best ground school that isn't a ground school. These are the best aviation content producers in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even listen to that with a straight face. These reviews cost us a ton of money, so finally it paid off. <laughs> I started listening to OB at the end of last summer and have been recommending the podcast since the summer of 19. If your podcast streaming provider is trying their hardest to make you listen to the podcast, 
just give in because it will be one of the greatest decisions you'll do for your aviation career or the little aviation bug that bit you. You will always learn something new or even more on a topic you think you already knew about. I never thought I would be waiting for Mondays, especially for a podcast, but here I am. Thanks, guys. Keep up the great work or good work. Lima Golf Tango from the Lobster Tea Potty. Bravo. <laughs> nice. I like it. Good one. All right, we're going to have a CA segment here. This week's Charlie Alpha segment. And really celebrating 250 episodes, so we have to do one, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, we this, have to do something. This is going to be a short little rant. I think both of us have enough energy to rant about this. Oh, I could make a show out of this. <laughs> we could. <laughs> so I am want to look back at a time where things didn't break and things were expected to last more than a couple of years. And if it didn't function properly, you could fix it. Those days seem to be gone, and I'm super frustrated. Gone. The latest in our house is a refrigerator that it's not a fancy bells and whistles, sorts of digital stuff. It's a basic refrigerator. French doors. There's a freezer on the bottom. It has water inside. It's not outside the door. Not a lot of things can go wrong, except for the whole building up frost and stopping producing cool air, which is happening. Right. It started happening a few weeks ago. I went to get it fixed, which that was after I took the thing apart. <laughs> I did take it apart. I figured out what I thought was wrong with it. But I said, you know what? I'm going to get somebody else to fix it because I'm not a refrigerator repair man. You're not. No. Huh. So an hour of, of labor was 375 bucks and the part was like 12 cents. Jeez. Yeah. It was ridiculous. I- I'm in the wrong line of work. That was 85 days ago. Why do I know that? Because I'm covered under 90 days. And the <laughs> same thing is happening again. Oh, so man. yesterday, no, two days ago, I, I scheduled them to come out again. Only because I knew I shouldn't be paying again. Or I, it's time to go get a new fridge. It's going to keep happening. That's probably how this story ends. But, hey, I'll take one more stab at it. Maybe there's something they didn't try to, the first time. So I made an appointment. It's this convenient window. Super convenient. The window was 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So like business hours yep, all day. With, uh, the only time you get an update is when they're on their way. So you literally just sit and wait. Do they provide the chain to to chain yourself to the house? <laughs> or do you have to supply that? You have to supply that. And you're really? on your own. Yeah, huh. it's totally on you. So I waited. I was up. I was ready. I, I had a lot of things I could accomplish in the house. At 5.03, I got a text. Your appointment's been moved till tomorrow from 8 to 5. Well, I had to work. I had to come in. There's no way that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So I had to move it to tomorrow morning after I get home from the mid. There, there's my rant. So now I'm on the ch- I'm on the hook all day tomorrow with no sleep. This guy better fix the fridge. He's, he's going to be, he's talking to the wrong guy. <laughs> Especially if they show up at 8.05. Right. And, I've, and I've gotten an, an hour nap. It's going to be bad. Mm-hmm. What's going on in your house? I installed a new dishwasher today. Mm, oh, congratulations. It's, Folks, it's if you don't know currently. this, you can install your own dishwasher. You yes. can do that. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I just read the directions. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, probably the sketchiest part is the electrical. I was just going to ask that. I can't <laughs> remember. They're, they're wired. You can... Some of them, you know, have... So some builders put an outlet back there, mm-hmm. but either way, you have to hardwire it from th- from the dishwasher to something. Mm. Um, but it has its own circuit; it has its own breaker. So I just cut that off and tested the wire and make sure. How you know, you just do, how did you do stuck that? Stuck it on my tongue. <laughs> I was gonna say with a <laughs> screwdriver or your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have one of those little uh, tweeter things. That, oh, beep, 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 beep. Yeah, you hold it up to the mm. wire and it... Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, it's good. That's safety first. Yeah. So same thing, though. The old one. Not a cup, Not but four or five years old. And nothing was mechanically wrong with it. The computer just stopped. Mm. Yep. It, it wouldn't open the little door for the soap. So that t- that yeah. function of the computer stopped working. It, it would just skip com- entire portions of the cycle or it wouldn't even go at all hmm yeah stupid 
and it resulted in you getting a new is it quiet have you tried it i don't care if it if it's quiet i told the guy i want the loudest most inefficient <laughs> dishwasher you have i just want it to clean i want it to melt plastic i when it's done i i want it so hot in there i can't touch anything with my hands <laughs> We started using a super quiet one when we moved to this house, and it yeah. is a, it's a game changer. You don't even know I, it's on. I think it's 50 decibels, this one. I, I have no idea what our decibels are. I don't know. I don't know how to compare that. But The first line in the description of the item is, is fingerprint resistant, mm. stainless, mm -hmm. 50 decibel. You know, they don't mm. even put the brand. <laughs> it's like... That's all people care about. Are the kids going to get their greasy little fingers all over it? And <laughs> right. is it quiet? And we actually want volume if there's children present so that we can. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Overshadow their noises. Yeah. Drown out their whining. All right. We usually don't call in negative rants, but that was a, a negative CA rant. It was, it had to yeah. be said. And we're way behind now. That's okay. Man, we're That's okay. way behind. That's okay. <laughs> timely feedback timely feedback all right i mm. there are two of these right no there's three there's three how about i do odds i'll take the i'll take one and three go ahead okay from patron <laughs> sierra alpha whiskey hey y'all ob248 patron sierra whiskey here show time short time listener long time Aviation weather nerd. I work for an EFB company. We'll call Foxtrot Foxtrot. Okay. Mm. And I was recently introduced to your show by my manager. Cool. I've been bringing... Oh, I'm... see? I can't read tonight. These stupid lights aimed at my face so that I can glisten for... <laughs> I've been binging from the beginning while keeping up with your present time episodes. Absolutely love the Inside Baseball and everything else about the show and OB248. AG mentioned that we should use weather observations from ADSB out aircraft and weather models. That was a very good idea. Although I'm aware of a few third parties making use of this data, I don't think it's incorporated into models just yet. However, there is another interesting project called AMDAR, sounding whereby some 140 UPS and Southwest aircraft are kitted with water vapor sensors and can sample a sounding on, is that, am I saying this right? Sample a sounding on a scent and descent? What's yeah. a sounding? What does that mean? A, sa a, a sample of air? I don't know. Uh, the data is transmitted over ACARS, which if you don't know what that means, I can't remember what it stands for anyway, but it's basically back and forth computer text messages for the plane to back to the home base. Uh, the, data, uh, the data are used in several ways, including as initial conditions for short-term weather models, benchmarking models, and for human weather forecasts. You can view more. I put links in the show notes at wxter.com slash ACARS and some additional helpful information from the national, what is that, NOAA? I always forget that one too. Uh, observe, uh, uh, national Atmospheric, Oceanic mm. and Atmospheric. I like it. Administration. Amdar.noaa.gov. This page links to a tool which shows when a National Weather Service AFD mentions an Amdar sounding in the discussion. It's interesting the cases forecasters find for this data. I love the show, except for your hatred of Kilo. Perhaps someday I'll write in with why we love the Kilo Sierra Whiskey. Well, you probably love it because you have an electronic flight bag that's responsible for more than just United States airports. So the K, the, K, the Kilo, is important. My, air, my airspace is entirely contained within <laughs> the kilo the zone. Kilo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So your and idea of using these airplanes as weather balloons is sort of happening already. That's good. Yeah. Why not? Thank you for sending that in. That's usually how my ideas are. They're just a little behind. <laughs> <laughs> Number two. <laughs> From... Patron Whiskey Tango Foxtrot in OB94. Wow. You discussed pilots who put the remark, no SIDs, no stars. Oh, my gosh. I just saw that last week. 
Oh, this is going to help. This maybe will help the eye rolling. Okay. There's okay. we have people I, who who agree with us. Go ahead. Okay, I look forward to that. <laughs> um, they put no sids and no stars on their IFR flight plan in the comments. You theorize it's a holdover from students being told that during training, and I'm sure that's part of it. It is even recommended in current version of the FAA's own textbooks. What? True, they add workload in older planes without a modern GPS, but those are getting pretty rare these days. What's really problematic is that some experienced pilots who should know better believe doing this will get them clear direct. They are usually wrong. <laughs> in, in busy areas, uh, anywhere near Bravo, you will get cleared for the route that ATC needs you to be cleared on. And rejecting a SID star just means they'll have to read all the waypoints to you over the radio rather than give you the procedure name. Don't be that person. Yes, please. Please do not. <laughs> also keep in mind that being cleared for a SID or star doesn't mean you'll actually fly it. Odds are you're going to get vectored, especially in smaller and slower planes. And then <clears throat> you'll get direct to some fix down the line. The SID star is there for three reasons. One, it preloads your GPS with a list of fixes they can give you direct to. Two, it saves you both time on the radio. And three, they know what you're going to do if you lose comms. Everyone wins. Yay. <laughs> Adding a SID star to your GPS's flight plan is just a few twists and clicks. If you don't know how to do that in your plane, a flight or two with a CFII is worth the money, especially if you don't fly much in areas where they're needed. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. So, hey, uh, I mean, in, in the, you know, in the old days, like f four years ago, before <laughs> everyone had <laughs> <laughs> GPS, <laughs> where everyone now is Slant Golf or Slant Lima or something. Right. That, Very that few exceptions. So before before that, I could get it. Like, hey, I'm a I'm a slant uniform, and doing this sit is really going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. I get that, okay, but that's not an excuse anymore. Like everybody has a GPS. It's super easy to put in. Mm -hmm. And guess what? If you're a plane that is going to, like for us, if you're a jet and you're wanting to go high, out of triad, you're getting a sit. Period. There's no other way it's going to happen. That's the only out of our airspace from <laughs> Triad. Right. It's happening. So unless you want to go at 10,000, <laughs> and then you're probably not going to get direct anyway, but, you know, you, yeah. anyway, I, I, I get it. You know, some of this, it's usually the smaller, it's GA yeah. planes, mm -hmm. um, and they're not going to fly it anyway. We're not going to give them a SID unless they're going super high for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, but I just don't get it. I don't, it's not, uh, yeah. If you're doing it because you're afraid you don't know how to program it fast enough, like I agree with him hundred percent, find out how to do it. You shouldn't go into a, a flight, not capable of programming something that you're very likely to get, especially like you said, going to a Bravo airspace airport, even if it's near Bravo, you're likely going to get one. So learn how to do it, get over that hump. And stop putting that in your remarks, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shall, shall I get number three? Okay. All right. From an anonymous patron and class Bravo controller, asked that we not mention his or her name. And I understand why. <laughs> <laughs> this is a safe place. This show is a safe place. Right. But now we're, we're taking one more layer of identification out. It's just a random Bravo controller. I wanted to add my two cents after patron Mike Kilo's well thought out, informative, articulate, and undoubtedly accurate feedback reference speed restrictions below the Bravo airspace. Uh, if you did not hear that, it was audio from OB249. It was very well done. It was very articulate. And you need to hear that. While most controllers are aware of the rule in our facility, witnessing an airliner slow unprompted in the middle of a busy arrival sequence where every single other aircraft mainta maintains 250 knots until instructed to do so almost always elicits off-frequency groans, complaints, 
and insults relating to somebody never having flown into a busy airport before. After seeing an airliner slow to 200 knots, I personally like to instruct them to slow to 230 and wait for them to reply that they are already below 200 knots, then ask them if the last guy slowed them, to which they, of course, reply, no, insert awkward pause. Then I start slowing everybody else behind them, one by one, just so everybody is clear. And let me assure you, if said speed reduction results in somebody needing broken out and resequenced, I'm choosing the one Sunday driver who clearly isn't in a rush anyways. Ouch. Ouch. Continue. They continue. All of that being said, if the administrator is listening, I do not advocate breaking any rules anytime for any reason. I think the rule is good one and there for a reason. The reality is, though, that 99.9% of airline pilots flying into busy airports do not comply and controllers are not expecting it. If any pilot out there decides to comply and you know it's busy, please mention you are slowing to the controller. I will say, though, that it demonstrates a deficiency in our particular Bravo airspace design that should be rectified. That's a good point. We are not pushing aircraft down low while fast for funsies. <laughs> Multiple parallel finals stretched out to 30 miles from the airport with aircraft three miles in trail requires some quote unquote technique. I took out the end of this where there was a little bit of narrative. I'll speak in broad terms. There are Bravos in the United States that have been redesigned. That is not something you can just push a button and make it happen. That takes a lot of energy from a few different places. And they all have to kind of agree on it. It takes, it takes a long time. It's literally an act of Congress to change the dimensions of that airspace. And for good reason, it's important. And the boundaries are important. So in the airspace mentioned in this, perhaps it can be adjusted to prevent an aircraft from being in that situation long downwind long final underneath a bravo shelf where they would have to slow down and mess up everything when like he said like he or she said the controller is not expecting it okay so just just to take away this isn't the first thing we got this week saying that they never see pilots comply with this we got a couple other snarky ones and there are places in the country where they'll come out and tell you. I won't throw them under the bus. They will come out and tell you we do not do that here. Stop. Maintain two five zero knots. Right. I'll yeah. resist. I'll resist. <laughs> up to include up to and including a King Air two hundred. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how, you know, say indicated speed uh, two twenty. I need you to do two fifty. What? <laughs> two fifty. <laughs> Hey, I need another engine. Let me descend all the way to the airport from here. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think we've, I think we've, I think we've beat that horse. Well, I'll add one more thing. I'll beat the horse one more time. Okay. This is from a, a controller that works that airspace, not somebody who's Monday morning quarterbacking like pretty much what right. we do. Because we don't have this type of airspace, and we're, we're not dealing with it day to day. This is someone who is dealing with that every day, and that's a real-life response. So if the administrator is listening, I will politely say either fix the Bravos so that this doesn't happen or revisit the rule. It needs to be addressed. I agree. So All right. now, we, now we can move on. Now we can move on. All right, this week's show topic is brought to us by SGAC patron Papa Charlie. Hey, guys, question about VFR flight following amendments. This is going to be fun. It's not uncommon for me to fly a dog leg, not direct, in order to stay over friendly terrain for more of the trip. Following your advice, my initial call-up consists, I love this, consists of present position, destination, type, and altitude. I receive my squat codes. I verify the altitude if requested, and I ident. <clears throat> I give other guests, pilots, a chance to converse with the host, ATC. See, this is etiquette. ATC etiquette here. This is mm. great. At an appropriate time, I call ATC back. Approach. I'd like to add a waypoint to my route of flight. I added that. Those are my tricks. 
This is Amazing. exactly what we've taught to do, is it not? Yes. We've taught this exact technique. So introduce <laughs> yourself, tell them where you're going, read the room, then go back and add these random places. Well, we're going to talk about that today. This mess, this, this method has always been well received. My question is, what types of waypoints are easiest for you as an approach controller to enter, and what types of waypoints will lead to the least confusion a few handoffs later? Some specific observations. You want to tap in here? All right. So air, using airports as waypoints. There are definitely some. There's, <laughs> I, I didn't write the this. pros and cons, though. I love this. So, yeah, they did this, not me. Yep. The approach controller typing in an airport <laughs> <laughs> loves it. I guarantee it. Because we. So if it's within like 100 miles of their airspace. They're going to know what it is. Sure. They should anyway. I, Yeah, caveat to that. Um, instant recognition, no back and forth. That's right. Cons. The center controller in whose airspace I'll be making this turn has clearly been watching my progress, eagerly anticipating their chance to play terminal controller. <laughs> what kind of approach do you want? Will this be a full stop? Why are you turning away from the airport? <laughs> It seems I frequently need to explain I'm just overflying. The airport simply defines my route of flight. The tone of the relationship shifts from nervous anticipation to rejection. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad. <laughs> okay. That is definitely a consideration. That So if you came from outside of our airspace and two fixes in, in your route or airports in our airspace, mm. I probably would be thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I would you be would, excited if I found out that you just wanted to overfly it, though. Right. I wouldn't be upset at all. Right. I'd be, oh, awesome. <laughs> Roger that. Way to go. Flight Plan of the Day Award. I'd hand it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, some people may not agree with that. And... It is easy, though. It definitely is easy. There's not a lot of back and forth. Um, I'll get the second one. Okay. Fixes as waypoints. So fixes, if you're not familiar, if you're not a pilot, are five-letter identified places in space that are just they're sometimes named after a place on Earth below those sp spots, but it's just five-letter fixes. Pros. No hurt feelings when turning over these. So you get to it, you turn, you're expected to. There's nothing else to do there except fly over it right so nobody gets upset the cons there's often some back and forth with approach when entering these fixes i'm not sure if it's because i'm vfr using a fix on the ifr low chart that's causing some confusion or the fact that one of my favorite fixes also sounds just like an airport in their airspace the fix is well outside of the approach controller's airspace so i don't expect them to be familiar with it and i always spell it out right after i say it not a big deal but it seems to require a little more effort getting it added correctly what are your thoughts on using ifr fixes rnav or along an airway for vfr flight following um it would if you're spelling it right after you say it and we're going to get up and go walk over and make an amendment i wouldn't be upset about it it'd be okay it would strike a lot of controllers as odd because if you're familiar with these fixes and you want to fly this way they might be inclined to say well, why don't you just file ifr well because i don't want to which is your right. right. You don't you don't have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but if you're going to follow all the motions and follow the same flight path, then pff, I would ask that question. If you're going to go through the fixes, you're one step closer to just being on an IFR flight plan. And you don't have to worry about airspace. So something to think about on the pilot side. I see That's you. true. That's true. Um, fixes, I might lead the conversation with... Hey, I, I want to add some waypoints to my route of flight. Advise ready to copy. <laughs> so that the controller can get a, something to write on. It probably is your strip, mm -hmm. but, you know, they can write it down. They might not always have a pen right there. Some facilities don't write on anything. So, True. you know, and so if you're going to have like two or three fixes, I... I with fixes, I would keep it as minimal as possible, as few as possible. 
we're going to get into the other options. You want to get the last one? Nav aids. I imagine this is easy for all involved if one is convenient to the route of flight. Yes, this is the best option. Agreed. These are the best options. A VOR, no NDBs, because no one is going <laughs> to any idea what that is. And a two-letter identifier. No. If somebody sees that in a flight plan, they're going to... Yeah, don't do that. Like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so VORs are fantastic. They're, they are akin to airports in terms of a controller knowing a VOR within probably even several hundred miles Agreed. of their facility. Um, there are obscure VORs that hardly ever get used, and there are more prominent ones. I don't know how you really differentiate between those two. All right. Um, but it's much easier. You could just say, I want to go to XYZ VOR to ABC VOR. Done. Um. A, a radial DME off of a VOR? <laughs> no. Don't do just, that. No. Uh, if you're wanting to mess with the guy, okay, let's say you know him. Like if I was flying through the airspace <laughs> and I knew who was who it was working, I I would have oh, some have ridiculous yeah. radial DME off of some obscure random... I like to use the one VA one airport <laughs> way up there <laughs> and do these really crazy, like one seventy three at 87, you know, like <laughs> there's like two major VORs in between that. Right. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, I would stay away from doing radial DMEs unless you absolutely need it. Like it's, you're trying to fly over, you know, your mom's house and it's there's nothing else near there uh i noticed we don't have grid coordinates in here absolutely do not but do, do not ask for a grid no. coordinate i would have no idea how to actually put that in me neither it's the format it's always different for mm. everywhere you put it in it's different so i wouldn't even know um uh, vfr waypoints mm. no don't no. do it you know, the controllers within, like, right around there might know what they are. But no one else is going to know what they are. Mm -mm. And I looked at the map a couple of weeks ago of our airspace and some of the VFR reporting points. I had never even heard of them. I, so. I, someone had brought this up early on in the show. Back in the single digits, somebody brought that up, I think. I still, I wouldn't know one if you told me. Outside of the one body of water north of Triad. Right. That's it. Hmm. All right. So I summarized this, and I think you pretty much mirrored what I was thinking. This is the order that RH would prefer. If, I, if I'm crazy, tell me. VOR is number one. Yes. Easily identifiable for the receiving controller and the sending controller. We know where you're going. Airports is second, and fixes after that. But fixes, I probably would... I, it would be hard for me to resort to that. Um, so, so let me add on fixes. If you are familiar with the airspace and you are familiar with the controllers knowing a fix mm, that mm -hmm. you don't have to spell, you mm -hmm. just say it and they're going to know what it is because you know that they use it all the time, do it. That's mm -hmm. great. But don't just randomly pick stuff like 100 miles out of their airspace and then expect them to know what that is. So I went back and forth a little bit with Papa Charlie on this, and he got a little more specific about the example. If you're going from point A to point B and you add three or four fixes, but it's a relatively straight line, you've accomplished nothing but confuse us. But if you're zigzagging for weather or trying to specifically get around a large Bravo area that you know you're never going to get a clearance in at that altitude, for whatever reason, you know this is how this story ends. I'm going to have to go way over here. And you want to do that by all means give us give us the vors give us the airports but if destination is a straight line 250 miles which is a long way in a single engine and and you want to give us five fixes on the way and, it, and there was no change to your course you've really not added any value to the flight plan 
but it helps us a ton for automation if you are going to be zigzagging. I would call it zigzag more than 30 degrees from straight. Yeah. Yeah, these are like major defining turns Yes, of the route. So if you know you're going to do that ahead of time, hey, good on you for planning ahead like that. A lot of VFR guys just see what happens, you know. They get up there, eh, I got to turn 90 degrees right for this build up. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that happens. That's not, I'm not, not no, to say that, that you can't it do that. It does happen. But if you know that ahead of time and you want to give us fixes and you're going to, auto, you're going to automate it's easier, which means we're going to be able to hand you off to the appropriate sector, Everybody's going to know what you're doing. And if you're worried about them thinking you want to do practice approaches this after you've done all this, you've added all those fixes, just say, Hey, if you don't mind putting my remarks that I do not want practice approaches done. Okay. Yeah. Overflying that, airports. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Brief. Just something simple. Yeah. Yep. And that goes to every controller outside of the controller that entered it in until you land. And then they know there's no anxiety. No, what does he want to do back and forth? It's just done. So, yeah. And you don't have to needlessly get center controllers excited about doing an approach. All right. <laughs> and then the huge letdown. <laughs> I'm glad we got to spend a little bit of time on that. It's been a while since we went back to that. And I think we have kind of breezed over that topic and not really yeah. gotten into the details of it. So if yep. you're kind of confused, we have encouraged you doing exactly what Papa Charlie said. Add some fixes. Help us out. If you're going to be taking these wild swings, like AG said, left and right, give us a heads up because it'll confuse us and we won't know what's going on. Yeah. And it will probably be a while before I recognize, <laughs> like, what are you, you know, where are you? That's what pro probably what I will ask. Where are you navigating to? Yeah. What are you doing? And then that'll be your chance to say, oh, I'm going to XYZ VOR to go around this thing. And that can make know. the difference on who we hand you off to. So for the yes. control or instructors out there who are saying it doesn't matter your VFR, in a lot of cases, they're 100% they're correct. It doesn't matter. But there are several examples, at least in our airspace, where it does matter. So let's say it doesn't matter to us because the fan that you're making with this change in, in route just goes into that other sector no matter what. Okay, but if it doesn't, or, or if it does, it doesn't matter to us. You're going to hand off to, let's say it's Duke, just fine. But what happens is now you're in Duke and you're in a weird place versus what your flight plan says you are. Mm -hmm. And so now it's going to be Duke's problem. Somewhere it's going to become a problem. Mm -hmm. yep. So in those major big turns and corners need to be, a, I think, defined by some sort of, you know, and... And even if, let's say, you're going to use a VOR and you don't want to because there's not one really close to exactly where you're going, it doesn't have to be exactly. If you flew 10 miles, you know, north or south of it, south of it, that would probably be totally fine. Agreed. Just give us a general idea. Okay. I, I like think it. we're... I think we're good. Okay. All right. Thank you, Papa Charlie. If we didn't answer your question, I think we did. Let us know if there's any follow-ups. Feedback time. Feedback. Whose turn is it? Man, the the chat room is out of control. There's 128 <laughs> unread uh -oh. comments. <laughs> uh let me do number one i think if i if i took out too much of this i can fill in for context Ooh, it's, pa that's a lengthy one too from patreon alpha juliet sierra i edited this down you're in the chat room i apologize if i took out anything super important but i think i got to the gist of what you were saying by the way your emails are fantastic but we only have an hour show is that too snarky no <laughs> i'm only joking please don't take that the wrong way uh, all right, this is picking up in the middle of this email. We decided to start a localizer approach to runway 31 at the Podunk Airport to the west, southwest. As we neared the area, we discovered the sole airplane at our aerodrome of intended landing was utilizing the opposite runway, runway 13. And having kept in the forefront of my mind my experience with the big bad DP uh, that we talked about a few shows ago, and despite the reported weather of calm winds, we reasoned discretion to be the greater attribute to valor. Uh, 
and planned <laughs> early to break off the approach higher than usual and circle to land on the currently in use runway. Hey, good. I like it. Plan, plan along with the one other airplane. After a Suppress, relatively yeah. uneventful, if somewhat meandering approach, <laughs> red tipsy fishing boat captain in moderate seas, <laughs> <laughs> we briefly, briefly graced planet Earth with the lightest of squeaks from our good years and then immediately pursued the heavens once more. Or you did a touch and go. Right. I like this. <laughs> you could be a writer. This is yeah. the way you're phrasing this is really good. Yeah. Once in the climb, my instructor asked me to treat the climb. Now, we've done a touch and go here, okay? We circled to the opposite runway we did an approach to. So now we're aiming back towards where we came from. We've done a touch and go. The instructor asked me to treat the climb as if we had gone missed. I asked him if he meant the missed approach procedure for the direction we were going, meaning 1-3, not the approach we started from the other direction, 3-1. I or he miscommunicated and he said yes <laughs> so i pulled the approach plate up for one three on my partially eaten fruit branded <laughs> tablet and began the turn for the one three missed approach procedure which included a hold at a different fix other than the three one missed approach after a few moments he asked where i was going and a few moments later remember the spongebob oh, i can't do it again we figured out <laughs> <laughs> and a few moments later, we figured out our miscommunication and navigated to the 3-1 missed approach holding fix as he had intended. My question, which I know by now you are desperately waiting for, as follows. A, after a debrief with a couple different instructors, I realized I should assume ATC would expect me to follow the published hold for the instrument approach procedure that I was cleared for, regardless of the circumstance of circling to land on the opposite runway, correct? Yes. But yes, 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 we would expect you to do the miss for the approach that we cleared you for. But at a non towered airport, we're typically protecting with altitude and it doesn't matter. Exactly. You're going to call us, hopefully. If you go Nordo, that's a whole different story. But if you call us and you're going the wrong way, we're probably just going to give you a climb and a turn towards your next airport. So, B, does ATC include an extraneous area in the protected area of an untowered airport, such as holding fixes, et cetera, for other approaches to the same airport when considering the one in out? One in, one out concept. Yes. A wide berth of altitude from the surface to the missed approach altitude. We're not going there. It's enough. It's enough airspace that if you come off in some crazy direction. Yes. And I'm not talking to you. I have time to turn the plane that I am talking to. Love it. Yes. Okay. Uh, see. Last one. Me, my in the moment logic, regulations maybe notwithstanding, was that I was already pointing the sharp end of the aircraft in the direction of the 1 3 missed approach procedure and therefore could reasonably expect that path to be free of pesky towers or large bits of granite, which might impede my continued progress through the sky. I'm telling you, <laughs> you got a knack for writing here. I don't know how to say that word. Can you say it for me before I embarrass myself? Whilst. Okay. Whilst making an uncharted turn to try to get back to the 3-1 missed approach procedure might not afford me the same confidence. Thoughts? Cheers, Alpha Juliet. All right, this is going to start an argument, and I don't mean to. Yes, it I, is. We, I we just see, talked about that. About we did. This. Yeah. I could see the inclination to at least start the conversation. Hey, I'm already aimed this way. If I took off from this area, I'm going back towards where I came from. There's no, you know, mountains or antennas i'm flying on the same place just going the other direction i'm i'm perfectly fine i'm going to speak as generally as possible that's not the intent of the design of that approach and the misapproach procedure if you already did a touch and go though you're also not complying with the intent of a missed approach which is facing in a correct direction or able to get to the missed approach point aimed in the correct direction towards a fix that you're aimed towards in space to keep you away from terrain and obstacles so if you've already touched down you've kind of it's moot you've you're you're basically starting over from scratch you're a takeoff now yeah so i don't think it's wrong for you to think that that might be the best course of action but i don't know that you'll find any regulation that agrees with because i've turned around and i'm circling even if you didn't do a touch and go you were just you went missed at 400 feet above the ground hey i'm just going to fly the mist for the opposite direction i get it but i 
I'm not, I'm not sure you'll find anybody that will, from a legal standpoint, agree with that choice. Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. I mean, this circling approaches, you know, you get into these weird scenarios yeah. where, hey, I'm, I'm in, you know, I'm turning base to final for the opposite direction. And right there I go, I go back in the clouds or I go mist or mm. whatever, which, you know, where do I turn? How do I get there? And there's a th- gazillion different answers to that. I think this answer works though all the time. Call ATC. Tell them I'm missed. Yeah. They will help yeah. you solve that problem. Start a climb. <laughs> climb. So start cl- start yeah, climbing. Gonna climb. And they're going to give you a turn to avoid this whole confusion over, I'm facing this way. You want me to turn around and go back to this missed approach? Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, really, on a touch and go, now you're into... S- SID or ODP territory. Really, it's probably at an uncontrolled. You're into ODP land. Mm-hmm. These are good yeah. conversations to have with your instructor, though. And you know, you may disagree. That's okay to disagree. And next time you meet the big bad TP, say, "Hey, here's the hypothetical. I'm on a circle. I'm airborne. I'm facing in the wrong direction, and I have to go miss because somebody's in, you know, a deer or a truck on the runway. Something. Which way should I go? It doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense to turn around." When I'm that low, it also doesn't make sense to just make up a new missed approach procedure. So true. Sorry. I went off on a little bit of a tangent on that one. All right. We're going to skip number two. I wouldn't expect the. Con- oh. Go ahead. I wouldn't expect the controller to um, recognize that you did a circling approach. A hundred percent agree with that. So they're not going to go, oh, look, he's doing a downwind for the other runway. And now I'm going to like just magically think that he's going to do the the missed Mm-mm. approach for that one. Nope. Yeah. We don't think, I okay. don't think we've ever said that in a nice way. When we, when we say goodbye to a non-towered airport, I have arrival. And we may look back down there again and see what you're, see where you are, but we're not watching any trends. We really don't know or have any reason to care what you do. Until you call us with a cancellation. Yeah. So, so. all right, we're going to skip number two. Okay. Number four is funsies. And you get number three. All right. The audio is getting really bad. Oh. Um, So your mouth and your sound is not uh, jiving for me. All right. So having like back and forth conversations becoming very difficult. Um, say something now. I'm saying something now. Yeah, it's like two words off. And here, I'll call you on the regular <laughs> phone. We could we could do a standby here. You want me to just call you on the regular phone? We'll get rid of the wonky, okay. wonky, some of the voice issue. I'll call you right back. Okay. Hello. 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 Okay. All right, here we are. Is is my sound matched up with the movement of my mouth? Yes, it's perfectly matched now. Okay, so the only people who hear that difference is the YouTube watchers, but we only have a couple more to read, so. Good. Thank you for stopping me. You get number three. Number three from Patron Alpha Alpha. Hello, OB, Patron Alpha Alpha. Thank you for everything, et cetera, et cetera. You stand untouched in the realm of aviation-related content online. Thank you. Anyhow, I was sitting down with the CFI in training the other day while waiting for weather to clear up, and he told me the following story. When he was building hours in the southern United States, he would often be on flight following heading into busy Bravo airspace. On the occasion, when the controlling facility tried to reroute him to the south all the way around, he said if he was feeling selfish, he might reply with cancel flight following climb to just above the Bravo ceiling and putts along squawking VFR with very little regard to rifles and departures that would inevitably have to be rerouted. He even said, I could have turned my radio off entirely. Oh my word. I think this was mostly being used as a lesson on what my rights are as a pilot in command and to illustrate the ludicrous situations you can put yourself into 
while still being entirely legal. Yes, I agree with that 100%. Mm -hmm. You're entirely legal, and it is ludicrous. Okay. It didn't seem like he was condoning it, but he made it clear that you absolutely can do that, and nobody can say anything to you. Okay, they can't say anything legally or, you know, uh, technically, I guess, but they can definitely say what you're doing is a terrible idea. I am agreed. <laughs> and we have said that before. Hanging out at 3,000 feet on the final approach course, you know, right outside the airspace, mm. you can be there. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible place to be. Mm -hmm. I know you've talked about people canceling flight following as a way to get out of participating in your instructions. But what I'm curious ab about is, if somebody does this sort of thing, how much of a headache is it? Will they really be reorganizing entire swaths of airspace just because someone decided to play a harmless game of the floor is <laughs> pilot deviate of the floor is pilot deviation? What? I'm not. That's not working in my brain. <laughs> We've gone as low as we can without a pilot deviation. How low can I go in terms of how how bad can I act? Oh, oh okay, okay, yeah. I got it. Okay. Before oh. I get a deviation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is there anything else pilots should consider when making the occasional selfish choice for their own convenience? Thanks, Alpha Alpha. Oh, man. Um, Is there anything else? Okay. As far as organizing swaths of airspace, it sort of depends um on who's going through there all the time and how long you're going to be there and what altitude you're at and everything else so mm -hmm. um there are definitely situations where if i am trying to take a vfr around a certain place and they say no i'm going to go there anyway uh it I was taking them around for a reason. So yes, I mean, I, I am readjusting. I'm going to have to readjust. And I'll tell you this, when VFRs that aren't talking to anybody come skimming around or they're flying around, especially like maneuvering right outside or right above the Charlie, not talking to anybody, controllers will tag that plane up mm -hmm. and, and call, give it the call sign watch. You know, and, and then flash it to the other sectors like, hey, keep an eye on this guy because he's out there in this bad place, not talking to anybody. So controllers definitely are noticing. Like you think if you're on a 1200 code, just not talking to anybody that nobody notices you, that you're there, you're wrong. They notice. You're a blue dot like everybody else. Yep. And just because you're legal doesn't mean you're in a safe place. That's why we endorse flight following all the time. Right. Except when and, you're in a hold by yourself on a four-hour flight and you're doing practice approaches. For 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Is there anything else pilots should consider when making the occasional selfish choice? Um, hmm. I mean, that's definitely on the top of the list. Uh, I don't know. Can you think of anything else? I, yeah, I can. I can add something to that. Like, if if you have a real, if there's a reason that's preventing you outside of you just don't want to, you know, there's clouds, it's bumpy, someone in the back is sick, give us something. Hey, I can't do that. Do you have any other alternatives? I can't do that right now, and here's why. It happened to me the other day. I had three of the flight school from the northeast on frequency. They were two of them were southwest bound. One of them was northeast bound. And I had maybe six or seven other airplanes that I was going around them with, arrivals and departures. And the, the call signs were getting a little bit confusing. I was starting to go down. I went down the tubes for like five minutes. I needed help. Someone had to watch me and make sure I didn't do anything stupid. But one of them said, I can't take this climb. That was my solution. I wanted to climb one of the VFRs another 2,000 feet. I said, we can't do it. There's a cloud there. Okay. Stay there. I'll take the other one lower, which is what I did. So... Okay, it's perfectly fine to have an opinion and not want to do something. But if the controller's busy and you've been getting instructions and you decide the alternative is, I'm done with you. That's a that's a 
you're not recognizing your place in this puzzle. And I don't think that's common. Just keep that in mind. If they're super busy, it's for a reason. We're not trying to punish you. We can help you find another solution. Just speak up. Yeah. But don't call for flight following. Dislike what we do and then say goodbye. That That's even worse. I think that's worse. That is pretty rare. It is rare. I think most people understand that, you know, they're not the only plane. Mm-hmm. And that everything is a little bit of a compromise. There's like one plane that gets to do whatever it wants all the time. And the president flies on it. Okay. Everybody else. Yep. <laughs> you're in it with everybody else. Yep. Okay. And just realize that as you are not the only plane, if you don't have an emergency or some other circumstance. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're getting bent around and taken up and down just like everybody else. And that is, it's not, it's not some, uh, conspiracy that, you know, these evil controllers concocted in, in a dark smoky room. (laughs) This has been developed over since the beginning of air traffic, Mm -hmm. these procedures, and it has been determined the most efficient and best way to handle these situations. It's all the time. We get the same stuff. It's the same stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. We're not just fabricating this stuff out of nowhere. Okay. All right. I, we skip number two. We'll get to them next episode. The last one. This is fun. From patron Sierra alpha. Hey, GNRH. With all this penguin talk, I finally get around to express my utter respect for controllers' brains or icebergs. Bricebergs? <laughs> Your penguins are so well trained, just calmly standing around waiting to get pushed off by the next penguin. Of course, you can be a controller. I too have some penguins. Most of the time, they behave like a flock of eight year olds that just sat through two hours of math class. My penguins <laughs> jump around, gelling, running, pushing, fighting. <laughs> doing somersaults or trying out new tricks with their skateboards. <laughs> no wonder they keep falling off the Bryceberg. I don't know what Bryceberg means. Did I miss that? Uh, I think it's brain and iceberg. Oh, got it. Okay. See? Yeah. <laughs> they keep falling off the Bryceberg all by themselves. No need for new penguins to do the job. Au contraire. New penguins are easy prey. So much fun to push them right back into the water. Uh, look at the giant splash that last one did. <laughs> Thank you so much for helping me understand my brain. My mother will be delighted to know it's not her fault. It took me years to convince at least some penguins to behave even a little and stay for a while. Keep up your great work. Thank you for making me laugh out loud frequently while cycling to work. Patron Sierra Alpha. Cool. A perfect reference to penguins at the end of the show. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we have feedback up to 8-31-2022, almost into September. I think the date, uh, something happened, and I could look back. Did we put a show on August 31st? Because we had 20% of our inbox was from that day. So August we only made 31st. it two days <laughs> in this episode versus last week, but we did make some progress. We cut down a lot of um, in the inbox in terms of quantity. So That was a Wednesday. Hmm, very weird then. We do get a lot of feedback on Wednesdays, but this one was 20% of our inbox. I'm telling you, it was a never ending. Huh. So, uh, check out atcsax.com or pilotsax.com to find a personalized bag to keep your headset free from dust and dirt. If we missed your feedback and you didn't hear from us and you sent it before 831 and it wasn't on the show or you didn't get a response, look in your spam. We, we responded. Try, try again though. Hey, G. Anything to add? Mm. I I'm sorry you have the mid. <laughs> uh, don't be. Later. <laughs> <laughs> I had the mid. It was terrible. You did not say a negative thing about it this week, though. Nothing. No build up. I had forgotten you had it until the middle of the day today. I said, you know what? I think he had the mid this week. It didn't say anything. I couldn't get out of it. I I know. I here and here's why. It was the dog's fault. <laughs> Because, <laughs> because 
Monday, I had to. Monday, I would have had to trade into a late shift. Mm hmm. Okay, to get out of the mid. But the right. dog had a grooming appointment to get his nails and his hair and everything cut <laughs> at five o'clock. Oh, what? So I had to have the early, I had to have an early shift. I had to. It's his fault. I'm never going to let him off the hook on that one. I skipped over something here. We had a new question of the week last week. We haven't done one in a long time. We asked what jobs you think we had before ATC and before flying. And why do you think that? We have made a folder. We have some interesting responses so far. Yeah, I saw a few of those. Yeah. <laughs> some of them. Huh. Anything to add before we close up? A uh, good, good 250. Yeah, I mean, happy. I feel like that was kind of a milestone. Mm-hmm. Happy 250. So it was okay to run a little long. Mm-hmm. And we only had to skip one feedback. I try not to do that. We'll get to you next week. I'm sorry. Julian Delser. All right. Closing out episode 250 of Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Romeo Hotel. And Alpha Golf. Goodbye, everyone. Drop. Visit OpposingBases.com where you can leave Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf an audio or written message. Find them on Twitter and Instagram at Opposing Bases or send feedback directly to their inbox at feedback at OpposingBases.com. The views and opinions expressed on Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent the views, opinions, or official positions of the Federal Aviation Administration, Department of Transportation, or the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. All show recordings are done on personal time and personal property. Actual air traffic recordings are from third-party sources, and no government resources are used in the production of the show. There is no nexus between opposing bases and the FAA or NACA. All episodes are the property of opposing bases and shall not be recorded or transcribed without express written consent. For official guidance on laws, rules, and regulations, refer to your local flight standards district office or a certified flight instructor. Opposing Bases offers this podcast to promote aviation safety and enhance the knowledge of its listeners, but makes no guarantees to listeners regarding accuracy or legal applications.